can check it out later so i think it's 4 o'clock so we can so before we do that uh, so can i know the demography of uh, this of the group so we have a quite a short group as it is uh, mostly a theory course so i i understand that lot lot of people want to attend so can uh, can you guys can you guys enter in chat uh, like what is the like which year are you in which year of your undergraduate or postgraduate so that i know the general field and how i have to explain any logic if you are working professional also you, you can write that also hello money so if you all can just write type uh, which year or what is your profession you are student or you are working professional if you are student then which year of your engineering uh, or uh, some other degree are you in so while you are doing that uh yeah so while you are doing that uh, let me tell you something that what we'll do in this in these sessions that we we are going to have so it is a 2 hour session so i myself believe that 2 uh, hours straight away it's uh, something that it's very difficult for anyone to concentrate so we'll try to wrap it up by uh, a uh, one and a half hour uh, but if uh, i feel that uh, energy is there we are all learning together then maybe we'll go till 2 hours and uh, one more thing that i don't like uh, bookish definitions in when we are learning things so in this course if you have gone through the big data uh, not not the big data the week one content there will be a lot of definitions and uh, so we'll we'll see how we can understand those definitions maybe we'll write the definitions but then we'll see how we can understand those definitions and uh, we'll move ahead with that so we will not do many mug up things in these sessions so green parrot is in first year btech agriculture engineering oh very nice very nice Mani Bharti is in third year BSc on us agriculture. Yes. If only I was also that much motivated, because I started even programming when I joined uh, after joining PhD. You guys have, uh, you guys are way ahead of me in in that case. So it's it's nice. It's also kind of motivating to see that people are interested. and one more thing i apologize in advance if i i will if i am not able to answer any of your detailed in depth questions but you can still ask me i will look back at it i will ask the faculty advisor and uh, maybe then i can get back to you on the next sessions okay so i think we are only going to get these these many responses from young youngsters so let's start the session then okay so first of all what was covered in the slide was and the present content was big data and uh, let's see what is what is big data so it basically uh, literally meaning is large number of data and uh, the field of big data so this is a field so they have made uh, name the field of analyzing this uh, large set of data as big data itself so if definition comes then we have to write that it is a field in which the we analyze we and systematically extract information from big uh, like from data set that is too large 
to be handled by traditional applications from data set that is too large okay someone has entered too large to be handled by traditional methods traditional methods so if, if you all uh, want to write then you you know uh, i will appreciate that you can take some pen and paper and start writing by traditional methods that's why i like this uh, kind of uh, writing approach rather than just showing the presentation because i myself get sleepy if i am not involved also in classes so that's why i like this approach so what is big data it is a field in which we analyze and systematically extract information from data set that is too large to be handled by the traditional methods like uh, so this is not this is not machine learning this is big data so like the programming aspects we do the statistical analysis we do all these things come into this okay so what is the source of this data you may ask the source of this data is the digital technology like your phone is a source your camera is a source all these things are the source it is digital technology that is why uh so I, after the boom in te digital technology only we saw we saw that uh, there was an increment you know so let me write this first yeah there was an increment in the reliance on data for a lot of the applications okay and uh, uh, one thing to note is that uh, that uh, the conventional uh, you know data storage things like the, such as papers and uh, the video tapes that were the films where each frame was uh, stored as a photo inside the frame film those things uh, the analog storage yeah uh, analog storage methods they are when so when when these analog storage methods were on their peak when the most of the data that was stored in the was in analog storage method then this kind of big data and other machine learning techniques were not very you know not very prominent only when the this uh, digital digital data digital storage came into picture that is it started the the shift from analog storage to digital storage which started from 2002 so uh, when that came into picture then only these kind of new techniques of machine learning and big data became uh, very, very popular so one of the thing is uh, this is the like uh, we can say pivotal year for all the new uh, you know technological advances uh in storage uh, we can say in terms of storage of big data large set of data so there are some challenges also in big data if you if anyone can tell me if you have gone through the slides a very fancy name was given to the challenges that is stored that are faced when we are in the field of big data or we are trying to analyze big data okay so they they were 5v so it's like these were the requirements then you want to deal with big data what were they first was volume so like where to store this kind of data then variety so the datas are not not just numerical datas there are different kind of datas also like the photo the pixel information then velocity the speed with which the data is getting created the veracity so i also i was not able to understand what this term meant so i googled it and it turns out to be you know synonymous to or you can use it for accuracy so if someone uh, wants to speak uh, is anyone having a, any question i thought uh, 
Okay. So I thought someone's uh, microphone just said. So. Okay, let me just switch on the automatic admission. Yeah. So veracity, accuracy of the data that you are getting and the value. So these are the requirements that big data field requires you to have and that were not met by the conventional practices of analyzing the data. So in after that, machine learning was developed, which was which provided a solution for these five requirements. So that's how the machine learning got developed before we got so much data and then we realized that we have much less technology to analyze this data and use this data and get some output valuable information from this data. So that is how this machine learning was coined or was introduced to us. Okay, uh, then we talked about artificial intelligence. It's a very, very broad field artificial intelligence. So how we can define or how we can understand artificial intelligence it's like it is the theory and development so theory being we uh, formulating some uh, procedure we formulating some mathematical equation we formulating some methodology for this and then the development using that theory to develop something so it is a theory and development of computer system, sorry, of computer system that is able to perform such tasks which will normally require some kind of human level intelligence such as uh, looking at a figure and realizing that the person is happy or person is sad, looking at a figure and realizing photo and realizing that whether it is of a cat or a car or something. So these kind of things are like uh, the examples that I have given are very trivial. Artificial intelligence is capable of a lot more things, but these kind of things to understand what is artificial intelligence, we can say that uh, theory and development of computer systems that is able to perform some, some simple task that will require uh, some kind of human intelligence or intelligence, not even human intelligence. No? We can re replicate rats behavior or something like that. So what were the examples that we had? So example uh, was given like Google. I personally uh, feel like Siri is the better example or Alexa or you are using Samsung than Bixby. You know, these things, speech recognition and then Google, you may not be able to directly link to this particular definition, but these you can easily, you know, connect to the definition that we have given that it is the development theory and development of some computer systems that we can use okay so now how through a flowchart can we understand this <clears throat> so first of all machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence this field this requires a very good you know you should have a very good background in mathematics multi multivariate calculus so because whatever we do, let's say I am trying to train uh, a, ma a machine. I am trying to make a model that is replicating my behavior to a particular external stimuli. So what I will do is I will record the stimuli. And uh, my response to it. So I will have bunch of different different scenarios and uh, my response to uh, those scenarios i will feed it into a computer then i will have a theory through which i am going to you know uh, kind of step by step do bunch of maths that we learn in uh, pro probably not in this course but in some other course that we do bunch of maths with this data and then i get a model now this model is capable of replicating to some degree it may not be 100 percent accurate but this model is now capable of replicating my behavior to some new stimuli
so some approx antriksh so my name is antriksh so it is going to give approx antriksh behavior right so this is a kind of uh, if you want to understand artificial intelligence like this uh, this is how uh, this is what it is basically this at particular uh, the flow chart i have shown you is the supervised learning which we are going to see but if you want to understand how a machine learns anything then this is how it is going to learn when i am using math so one thing we have to understand is the machine does not uh, differentiate between stimuli means it uh, in in a general kind of sense in a sympathetic kind of sense it is just going to reduce those all stimuli into numbers so let's say if uh, someone punched me that is a stimuli and then and the response i got angry so when i am going to enter this stimuli into the machine this model or i am going to analyze using some mathematics so the machine will take it as a 1010 1, or some kind of number between 0 to 100 it doesn't know that okay this stimuli is for punching right so we have to understand that the model that we have made it's like it doesn't have consciousness it's not making a conscious decision it is just making some kind of mathematic it is just giving some kind of mathematical output based on some mathematical input yeah so uh, there will be a lot of uh, you know kind of uh, uh, talks in youtubes uh, different different podcasts joe rogan podcast or there is a scientist who talks about machine learning so there is a lot of debate whether uh, much artificial intelligence has consciousness or not that is separate topic that uh, we can get into detail so uh, what are the three cognitive skills of artificial intelligence so but artificial intelligence often is confused with machine learning we'll see what is machine learning but there are two things that artificial intelligence has more that machine learning doesn't have so first let's see what are the three cognitive skills that machine learning have and then we'll see what artificial intelligence has and what machine learning has so three cognitive skills first is learning second is reasoning and third is self correction so pardon my writing uh, that's why i am saying also so loudly so that you can understand this so learning based on what we have given the data the uh, the artificial intelligence is going to learn then it is going to reason so when you have let's say uh, some contradictory conditions we we gave uh, our machine learning uh, let's let's look at this itself let's look at this uh, i said i got punched and the response was anger but let's uh, just imagine that if some small my small brother is punching me then i will not be angry it will be a kind of uh, you know the feeling will be different so i have given the training set for this artificial intelligence for uh, you know uh, to make a model in and in that model if a punch is there then uh, no it is uh, giving a response of anger but then when it encounters some external you know uh, external stimuli it sees that he you no know, this guy didn't get angry when uh, small kid has punched when the intensity of punch was less or uh, the you no know, the stimuli fro was from someone relative so then it is going to reason with that output and then it is going to self correct itself so next time what it is going to do it is going to introduce a new parameter let's say what is the relation of the the person who punched with me or what was the intensity of that punch with me so these are all the things that you know artificial intelligence has that uh, machine learning doesn't have machine learning can only learn so it will learn but artificial intelligence it will reason with the output and then it will it can self correct itself also so it can keep improving whereas machine learning you have to make a completely new model if you want uh, you know to encounter for uh, for new new kind of parameters okay so this is machine learning there are some advantages and disadvantages of machine learning so let's yeah let's write them here what are the advantages so i will not 
you know state all the advantages because some of them are very menial so what is the advantage so if you have data heavy job oh sorry uh, advantages of artificial intelligence i said machine learning so if you have a data heavy job lot of data uh, excel sheet com uh, you know, containing let's say 10000 rows and i say that okay now you go through this and uh, tell me what is the relation between all these parameters so then uh, we'll quit the job we'll not do that job right so for that those kind of jobs we have uh, we can use artificial artificial intelligence and uh, let's say consistency so since artificial intelligence is used for uh, can be used for checking a paragraph or checking some the write up so there is a con uh, so and machine has a consistent output so we can use them because let's say i'm correcting a paragraph and just before correcting i i was in a good mood or at the correct time of correction i was in a good mood so i will correct it differently rather than uh, when i was in a bad mood so when we were all in school we would have realized that if our professor is angry we should not ask him uh, to not teach the class or we should behave very nicely and if the professor is very happy, then we can ask him, sir, uh, can we skip the class today or can we not teach? We have some exam we want to prepare for that. So that and all is not uh, there with artificial intelligence. Sorry. I don't know what happened. Yeah. So it will be consistent with its output. And then it will be always available so when once you have made an artificial intelligence model or tool and you have uploaded it to the, to the internet so it will be available for everyone always it's not like it needs to take rest it, it is doing a nine to five job it's not like that so it is always available now what are the disadvantages there will be several more advantages now let's look at the disadvantages so first of all, to make something that good, it is very costly. Costly in the sense, there uh, see there are two type of costs. One is initial investment. So that kind of cost also will be high, because when you, we are making artificial intelligence tools, we need high quality uh, computer systems, and so that like G, high GPU, high CPU, we need. So that is some a uh, cost, and then second cost is to hire a personnel which actually has the knowledge of uh, you know investing some uh, some time to the and to develop uh, de develop this kind of tool so lack of experts in the field of artificial intelligence not not, not many uh, professors also uh, you know will be able to do this kind of job the, the people who are they are in silicon valley they are pay, getting paid big bucks so yeah limited number of experts and then lack of generalization one of the major limitations of artificial intelligence lack of generalization so artificial intelligence if you make a model for some person or something it is not necessary that you can use that same model for all the scenarios so this lack of generalization is you know very major limitation of artificial intelligence now one more thing that i like to add that uh, may not be you know is not necessary for you to add that is sympathy you know the robots don't have sympathy so as a joke you can have this sympathy artificial intelligence doesn't have sympathy okay now, now let's talk about machine learning we have looked at artificial intelligence let's talk about machine learning as i said machine learning is a uh, like only has one of the skills cognitive skills of artificial intelligence how many skills artificial intelligence had cognitive skills it had uh, it had learning and then reasoning and then self correction Whereas machine learning is only learning. And that is also 
statistical or stochastic uh, those kinds of that learn uh, i don't know whether i've written it correctly or not yeah statistical learning it is a part of artificial intelligence that focuses on da uh, data and algorithm to imitate uh, the way humans or anything uh, will react and then gradually the accuracy will be improving as you give more and more data just but uh, the important thing to note here it that is it is a branch of ai branch of artificial intelligence so the the bubble that you know that describes uh, this the relation between artificial intelligence machine learning and something more that is called the deep learning that we'll look at here it is that artificial intelligence is the mother mother branch and then there is machine learning inside that and then there is if you go more specific then there is deep learning and you know in uh, in this course that uh, machine learning in soil and uh, crop management most of the studies are using deep learning deep learning is a type of which will it will use artificial neural network and you would have seen in uh, sorry in a lot of papers also that they are using artificial neural network or convolution neural network so we'll see what when we call something a deep learning when we call something a shallow learning so so this this is the relation so one thing to note is that machine learning just has learning and it focuses on the use of data and algorithms to imitate the way humans learn or uh, anything responses to imitate the way certain something responses and then gradually improves the accuracy as we give it more and more data okay so now let's look at what is deep learning so i said artificial neural network uh, is anyone familiar with artificial neural network you can raise your hand okay so the first year uh, first year guy most probably will not be familiar they would have uh, you will have heard it somewhere and uh, third year also maybe i was i was not familiar with artificial neural network when i was in my btech okay so i will take gulshan sensor as a answer for all of you so it is you are not familiar with artificial neural network okay so then what is artificial neural network just let me just spend it will uh, it will be a slight deviation from the course content but let me just spend uh, you know 5 minutes to explain what will be artificial neural network you know in our brains let's say i am drawing a human a very crappy human let's say this is a human okay so and uh, this is a hand now when i touch something how do i how do i okay so how do i know that i have touched something i know when, because here my the neurons that are responsible for touch they transmit this signal and then uh, it goes to my brain and then uh, in the brain some function happens and then i know that okay i have touched something or whether it is like whether what i have touched is hot or cold or something so what has happened there has been an input and there has been a different sort of uh, mathematical operation inside my brain and the final output was okay this surface was hot or this surface was cold let's uh, you know go away from touch and let's look at the feel that we have so this surface is hot or this surface is cold so how how does it do so we have one input if you if you see here we have an input similarly we have input for different different scenarios so artificial neural network it tries to replicate so let's say i am trying to uh, replicate this behavior and uh, this is the thing so when i am uh, when i touch something so first of all it needs to know whether i uh, to feel something cold or not it needs to know whether i have touched something or not so 
touch yes or no it's going to be one input second what my cells are feeling so the finger cells what are they feeling that is an input so let's consider these two inputs as of now and then there may be several more inputs that my finger is feeling when i have touched some surface so then yeah so my hand or some my finger will be feeling that i have touched some surface and then those signals will be transferred to my brain and there is going to be some kind of operation so through research and uh, through observing humans what we have tried is how to replicate that is let's say these are all your inputs and this is our operation and one output is output is one whether it is hot output is one whether it is oh, sorry hot or cold so let me draw them previously i had drawn hot or cold so the uh, scientists researchers have narrowed down and they have settled on a matrix kind of a neural kind of arrangement to replicate this black box that that is our brain so let's say we say that these are neurons that different different neurons give different different signals to our brain for a, a response and this is this is the brain mechanism so this is neuron 1 2 3 4 5 let's say five neurons are giving some signal uh, to your uh, brain based uh, based on the touch that we uh, we have uh, touched a surface so what uh, researchers have identified is is that you take these neurons actually we uh, will give signals to different neurons that are in the brain so forget about hand to brain we are not looking at how the signal is being transported we are looking at how after being transported to the brain how the signal is being processed okay so this is your hand and this is your brain so these are the like neurons in your hand these are the neurons in your brain so you see that all the neurons are communicating with all the neurons so all these neurons gave the signal to this neuron and if i change the color all and all these neurons are giving signal to this neuron also and similarly for all and then again all these neurons are giving signal to this neuron and similar way here also it is happening so it is kind of a very complex relation between all the neurons and finally the neurons are going here and uh, they are transmitting here and they are giving it some value for so these neuron it is the hot neuron or it is the cold neuron so they are giving some value so let's say if this value is more than some threshold so it is more than 0.5 for this so it's 0.6 for this and 0.4 for this then we will say okay so hot is more so i felt hot when i touched that surface so this kind of jumbled way of neurons interacting with each other based on the input and then giving uh, output for different for uh, different stimuli is called uh, this representation is the artificial neural network and this uh, neuron that are working for brain that are representing the functioning of the brain that are hidden from us these are called the hidden layers why i am saying layers is because i have had two i am having two layers one is this and one is this so these are hidden layers that represent the brain let's say this is the input this is the output and these are the hidden layers that represent the brain so this is basic representation of your artificial neural network okay and this and what is deep learning so it is artificial neural network only but when we have more than one hidden layer so what i can do i can in, uh, inside this brain if let's say this is a very simplistic model this will not be able to replicate all the things that i am going to do like i just don't touch i speak i communicate with some people so on only these eight neurons that are arranged in two layers they will not be able to you know replicate my behavior in total so when i use 
various number of layers like 10 layers or five layers and uh, there are number of neurons in that and then i use that for a neural network training or any machine learning problem then we say that is deep learning and when i have only one layer so i have an input i have an output and inside i have only one layer then i call that as a shallow learning so this is deep learning when i have more than one hidden layer and shallow learning when i have only one hidden layer so yeah so that is what deep learning is now let me erase this oh, but if i erase, okay yeah let me erase this so what uh, you will be getting is something so this is i am just using for explaining so what i will be sharing will be a short note of uh, what how how i have written the notes when i looked at the presentation and the videos from uh, the nptl portal so this uh, these these portions i am just uh, sharing for every representation so now we have understood what is deep learning and what is artificial neural network there is something more called convolution neural network which is uh, much better than artificial neural network in some in some practices we we'll look at that in later later presentations later slides so before that you know uh, there was a one very nice figure that uh, i forgot to show you guys that differentiated between the traditional programming and the machine learning so re remember this is machine learning this will and since deep learning is a part of that so that also applies to this okay so in traditional programming we had a computer we gave it data and we told it what it has to do so we gave it a program a program is is just a set of instructions and then it gave us some output but in machine learning what it is going to do we will give it data and we will give it expected output and machine learning is going to identify the set of sequences or the set of procedures that it has to do on that data to get that output so, and then it is going to give us a program in more general term it, it doesn't give us a program it gives us some parameters for some uh, pre decided program so it is going to so it is going to give us a program and then i can use this program to get the output for some new data so i use this program i give it new data and then i can get some kind of output that uh, we will ex uh, we will expect based on the trend that we uh, we have given this data and output one more thing that is important in machine learning is always to validate your uh, model so we'll look at that later basically what that means is after you have trained this uh, your computer program and you have obtained some kind of sequence that this data has to go through to get the output you have to check also that whether you have done a good job of machine learning or it's just like uh, you know normal traditional operation only and we are just using lot more resources to do that so before uh, machine learning when i learned this topic machine learning through uh, i learned actually from coursera so that was general machine learning so it is uh, very important to first look at the data and understand whether we actually need machine learning in that or not and after we have done machine learning still we need to check whether the model that we have used is actually correct or not so basically to do that as you as you would have seen in the presentations also that we need to split this data into training data and test data so that uh, we we can see how the model is responding to a completely you know new set of data so that and all we look at we look at but i just wanted to show this flow chart this very nice flow chart that shows that how you know uh, machine learning is different than the normal traditional learning 
so if you have any question what you can do is you can raise hand then i will stop and uh, i can try to answer that question if it is in my capacity okay so okay so what are the types of uh, learning not just machine learning you can just, just say learning why i am saying learning and not machine learning i uh, will see so i am not uh, i am not i will not be covering all an entirety of the content of the presentation that you can download from the nptel portal i'm just touching on the topics that i feel that are important and needs to be discussed okay so what are the types of learning one is supervised learning there is another name that i also didn't know earlier it was that inductive learning it is it can also be called as inductive learning what is this uh, type of learning so supervised supervised means that we are looking at it we are saying okay what you are doing this is uh, you are supposed to do this for this you are supposed to do this for that so we are telling the system what it has to do for certain data that is supervised learning and that only translates to nice mathematical term is that when we are giving it some training data that data is labeled labeled meaning we are telling it that for oh, sorry we are telling the machine that for this set of data like one set of data this is the output second set of data this is the output so we are telling it what it has to do for cer certain uh, set of features or certain set of values and then we are allowing it to train itself and make a function that is going to map such that it can give this kind of response so that is supervised learning when the training data is labeled with the desired output so i'll just remove this and write it here training data is labeled with desired output okay and then if if it is supervised then there should be definitely unsupervised learning so what is unsupervised learning so from uh, you know from common sense we can understand that this is going to be training data that doesn't have labeled output so or we can just write that unlabeled training data and if there is supervised learning and unsupervised learning then there must be a semi supervised learning right so there is all in fact something called semi supervised learning i have never used it and nor have i seen anyone using this kind of thing but it no, according to the definition it uh, it says that it is a kind of it's a method method of learning where some of the training data is lab labeled and some of the training data is unlabeled so basically what it means is uh, first you do so if if i understand it correctly and i think i do how uh, this thing works is first what you do is you have bunch of data and you perform unsupervised learning on it and then you classify it and then you have uh, labeled data some sort of labeled data and each of these classified labeled data you perform that supervised uh, you know you bunch you group it and you expect that they are going to give similar output but it's not very important so i will just uh, write it here as not important because we don't use it that that often so if you don't understand what is semi supervised learning just uh, no need to fret about it what is and why i use type of learning not type of machine learning only was because of this a very fascinating learning algorithm reinforcement learning and actually we humans we also learn through this reinforcement learning only see why 
uh, what is reinforcement learning it's very simple and it is very similar to let's say uh, i am solving a question i solve it correctly so i have done some uh, you know kind of processes I'm, i have done some sequence of action i have taken some steps and i have arrived at a correct answer so i and then the answer is correct my professor or my teacher gave me a chocolate so he is reinforcing that behavior or those steps into my brain so next time if i uh, come across some kind of similar problem i'm i remember that i was you know given a uh, reward for that those step of actions those step of sequences then uh, i will use those sequences only and then i will again get the answer so that is reinforcement so i did a bunch of actions i took a, i followed a sequence and i got a good answer and then i was rewarded for it that is and i so that is being reinforced that learning is being reinforced into my brain and if i uh, take some action and then i don't get the desired output or i get the wrong answer for a problem and i get punished by the teacher then i am not going to do that again for that same problem so then this is very similar to how we, we humans learn in school right so that's why i said type of learning not type of machine learning because we humans and the animals that we try to train the dogs that we try to train through treats they also learn from uh, reinforcement learning and a very good example so first let me write it here so it is reward the sequence of action giving desired output so i don't know if you guys surf the internet or not but if you do you must have come across the videos of people saying ai learned to play flappy bird ai learned to play car race ai learned to play mario so how do these guys do that they use a neural network and reinforcement learning to train uh, these kind of uh, computer program to play that game so if at all you are interested in developing those kind of things then you should learn artificial neural network and reinforcement learning and you will be able to make those videos or make a program that can play any game okay so that is reinforcement learning so good behavior is rewarded and uh, bad set of sequence is uh, you know punished so what is the difference so oh, before that let's yeah let's look at uh, before the difference let's look at the different type of supervised learnings yeah that will be good so what are the types of supervised learning there are two types as i know that is regression and classification when we look at unsupervised learning you may have uh, some hint of doubt that Uh, that unsupervised learning is similar to classification but it is not and we are going to look at it in the unsupervised section so what is regression when your input data let's say x and your desired output let's say y these both are numerical they both are numbers and they are continuous numbers that that means they are real numbers not like 1 2 3 4 like 1 and 1.001 1. like that very continuous kind of uh, numbers numerical outputs and inputs then the type of learning that you have to use is called supervised learning and uh, what is classification learning very nice example for that would be uh, as i uh, said earlier also i give you a photo and you tell me whether in the photo i see a, you see a human you see a cat you see a dog you see a tree what do you see in the photo so this is not number now the output is not number it is a category so categorical classification is being done of this photo so that is uh, supervised learning for classification so how do they do it i'll just give you overview 
so when you have a photo it is made up of pixels and uh, so i think uh, we all will be knowing and we all should know that all the colors that you see in your screen uh, they are made up of three basic colors maybe they are called cyan magenta and uh, something else but we generally called in programming language rgb red green and blue so your screen that you are looking at currently right now it is uh, made up of pixels small small cells in that red has some intensity in one pixel red has some intensity green has some intensity and blue has some intensity so in this portion of the screen that you see the green portion the green will have more intensity for this pixel and if you see here all are having full intensity that's why we are seeing white so when we do this classification kind of problem then we convert this photo into first of all into a matrix of uh, or an array which uh, will have one for red one for green one for blue we extract the values of rgb from the pixels and then we train the model so you didn't need to know that but just i just wanted to share a background so the input is still numerical only even though this is a photo we have to do some kind of pre processing and uh, we have to get numerical inputs like the what is the value for r here 255 what is the value for g here 240 or something and then you train it and final answer is categorical human cat dog or tree so input is a number and output also basically you can uh, say it as a number you can give human 1 cat 2 dog 3 and 4 but in this case the output you see it's not continuous number it's 1 2 3 4 right so this is classification so if you if at all you guys uh, will start learning then you will realize that actually machine will not tell us that the uh, the photo is like it will not type that uh, this photo is human we have to associate a number with that and when we are training then the number when we get this one then we will be able to say that it is human so it will not just directly say as human we have to convert all the photo and the category in some kind of numbers to train our you know model okay so what is the methodology for learning supervised learning so these are the two things these are the two types of supervised learning how does it work first of all supervised learning will have what kind of data it is going to have it is going to have labeled data so we have labeled data and as i said to you earlier that in any kind of machine learning model validation is a very important part so that you know whether the model that you have trained is will actually work for different kind of uh, scenarios or not so for that i said we are going to divide the label data that we have into something called training data that the model will use to get to the function that is uh, going to give the correct output and then there is a test data that uh, th these are the unseen data sets that are labeled data sets that the we will using which we will check the model so first we split the data into training and test data then we use this data to learn then the machine uses this data to learn and then it gives us some model this is the model now we use this test data in this model and we validate the model this process will be validation so how do we know whether this uh, i have okay so hemant has raised hand yes hemant you want to ask something hi hi good evening uh, this is hemant yeah uh, so uh, so uh, the training data and the test data both are the same or uh, different no 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 so, so training data, see we have let's say we have a uh, thousand of data so what we are going to do using some uh, algorithm or let's say 50 50 we will use 500 data for training and using that data my model will identify the parameters that are giving good good answer so that uh, for the training set and then that model i will use to check 
what output it is going to give for my test set so they have to be completely independent from each other they are not the same okay yeah thank you yeah so once we have the model uh, which we have trained using the training data we are going to use the test data to validate the model and uh, in i am not going to show the formulas but in the slides you will be able to see sir, uh, sir has shown that there are different type of uh, values you no know, different type of errors that you can compute to check the whether the your model is correct or not they involve rmsc root mean square error mean absolute error and then something more that was r square uh, that was i think called uh, coefficient of determination yeah coefficient of determination that varied from 0 to 1 so the lower the error and the higher the coefficient of determination the better your model is so yeah and this goes from 0 to 1 that uh, that will that you can look at from the side but this is the thing that the lower the error the higher the correlation value the better your model and that that we check for the test data so let me remove this and write it nicely that you use your test data for validation test data for validation and validation you use uh, you do using statistical parameters so you check what is the r square what is the error and if the error is less then you say okay the model performs good okay, so this is how this kind of uh, you know supervised learning works a very very rough you know representation of supervised learning oh so i have one more slide for supervised learning so here let's uh, so abhishek J has a question. Yes, Abhishek. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. I had a doubt. Uh, for testing data, how much percent uh, percentage of input we have to allocate, sir? So it can completely depend on you. So uh, usually, what we do, so we want to train our model nicely, right? So we need yes. good amount of uh, training data also. So usually, let's say seventy thirty will be considered a good. division so 70 percentage data you use for uh, training, training and then 30 percent you use for testing so okay okay yeah 70 30 60 40 something like that okay, thank you sir yeah. okay so now how do you classify your uh, performance so something called classification metric was discussed and uh, i feel like there uh, may might be a question in your uh, question also in your quiz or assignment so let's look at that classification metric classification performance metric but i'm just writing here uh, let me just write classification performance metric so it is it looks like a matrix it is a matrix so here we have our correct or true answers that uh, 10 and here we have predicted answers so let's say you are actually looking for a patient whether a patient has uh, uh, some kind of disease or not so uh, let's say 1 means has disease and 0 means doesn't has disease for this correct one and here the one means uh, model said yes model said he has and zero model says he doesn't have so what are what are the possible errors so first thing uh, first if our model is working very nicely we have done a very good job of training our model then what it will do when the person has a disease then model will say yes it is it has the person has the disease so it will be true positive and if the model if the person doesn't have a disease then model says okay it is uh, it the person doesn't have a disease so true negative but there are some places where the when the person even if he doesn't have any disease but the model can tell no he has so it will go into 
this section that is false positive and then if the person has the disease and the model says no he doesn't have then it will be false negative so how how do we write this t p and of all those things from uh, the expression so i um, it may be very trivial for you but i just want to share this that you use true when the model is same as actual and then positive or negative uh, it will be based on what is the model saying whether it is saying you have or you don't have and it is false when the model doesn't have model is not equal to the actual response so if i were to ask you that if a person didn't have the disease but the model said yes he has the disease uh, which notation you will use can you write in the chat box so i will i will write the question again person has disease but model says no so what will be the what will be the type of error in this case false negative correct hemant has so but then hemant false negative was money uh, money hemant is saying true uh hemant has developed a new symbol uh, that is i i guess it was by mistake hemant yes sir it's by mistake oh, okay no problem okay so false negative is the correct answer nice so i think uh, they there was there might be a question in your thing in your assignment you will be able to solve that by now and then using these things uh, there was an accuracy and then recall all those fo uh, formulas are there you can check in the slides there might be some kind of uh, not in the assignment but in the future in the exams there might be some kind of question so uh, using that you might have to calculate the accuracy and recall and other things so let's move on to unsupervised learning we have discussed the supervised learning let's move on to unsupervised learning unsupervised learning is very interesting how will the model work you know when you don't even tell it it what it has to do with the data you know what what is the output that you want from the data so i don't like calling this unsupervised learning kind of thing but uh, since it is called so we have to stick to the things that people before us have told so basically where do you use this kind of unsupervised learning you use it to cluster a set of data let's say uh, you know you you have you run a club and then there are uh, you have lot of a big like you have 10000 members in the club now you don't want to go and uh, you know check each of the members and then you will remember that this person was good to me this person was bad to me this person pays more this person pays less but let's say you have an excel file where you have stored all this kind of data and then you want to classify your uh, you know you want to cluster your members club members so to decide which people you can give some kind of offer some kind of premium premium membership so what you do you have the you give the unsupervised learning uh, technique you give the na uh, name you don't give the name just you give the amount of money spent and then behavior and then uh, height and income and the frequency of visit you give it you give the you know unsupervised learning model these all parameters and then it is going to give you a class it is going to give you a set of clusters so let's say you want and the number of clusters it's de completely dependent on you either you can have two groups good members or bad members or you can have uh, another kind of group that is uh, good members very good members no very expensive members or uh, faithful members like that so let's let's just represent it in dots so these are the dots that represent your uh, members 
and they are they have all these kind of features and in the end you realized that you have four clusters you see these people are very frequent to your club and they spend more money these people very rarely club uh, come to the club and then they don't spend that much money these people come to the club rarely but then spend more money and this this is some another group so if you have done this kind of uh, clustering then you see that these people if you give some kind of uh, uh, you know uh, benefit to them or not uh, don't give any benefit it is not going to be uh, very helpful you know it is not going to change your output that much but if these people you give some kind of benefit like some kind of schemes you give them like discount then their expenditure will increase in your club because they are already coming uh, more in your club or if you do some kind of if you decide some other methodology you can increase shift these kind of people also to more money more more visit people so this kind of unsupervised learning that is used for clustering of the data can be used in different different techniques so i think uh, sir mentioned that it can be used in marketing so this is also one kind of you know example of how we can use in marketing so what does unsupervised learning does so we don't tell it what to do but we tell it what no we we don't tell it how to do we tell it what we are expecting we are expecting a cluster of people uh, based on this this parameter so what it is going to do the model itself finds a hidden pattern and insight from the data that you have given to this so then again uh, if your model is trained for only the expenditure and visit it is going to give you the expenditure and visit data if it is trained for different different kind of behaviors it is going to give you different different kind of behaviors uh, different it will classify based on or it will categorize based on different data so why i was saying if you remember earlier i said that it may look like classification but it is not be, uh, because i am not telling it already that these uh, these members of my club are very uh, frequent or like i am not telling it already that these members are very good members right oh sorry these members are good members these members can be good members these members are not very useful and these members are some somewhere in the middle so i am not telling the model it is just giving me a cluster and when i look at the cluster i realize okay this is a group of cluster so let's see okay so they come more and they spend more so they are good members okay this is the group of members that come more but spend very less so i am doing the tagging of the class but the unsupervised learning model is giving me just a class one more example of this that sir shared was let's say i give you a bunch of uh, apple and a bunch of uh, orange and then the model will doesn't know what is apple what is orange but based on the touch based on weight based on color and density it separated the apple and orange and only after that i went and i saw okay this is the apple group and this is the orange group so was it uh, so were you able to understand how this unsupervised learning is different from the classification supervised learning okay nice <clears throat> okay so there are types of oh we will write it here itself there are uh, there are types of unsupervised learning that is clustering that is the uh, classif uh, the kind of grouping that we saw between apple and uh, orange and then there is association that is a little bit uh, little what do we say little tricky and little complicated than just clustering because in this association we just don't group don't just group the data you try to identify the relation between them also which i i don't think we are going to use very often it is uh, this is the one that i think uh, sir told was is used uh, very often in marketing this is the apple and uh, orange i think he used watermelon but just let me let me use orange 
सो एप्पल एंड ऑरेंज डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन और क्लस्टरिंग ओके सो नाउ वी हैव लुक दैट सुपरवाइज लर्निंग एंड अनसुपरवाइज लर्निंग आई एम नॉट गोइंग फॉर सेमी सुपरवाइज लर्निंग बिकॉज एज आई सेड इट इज नॉट दैट इम्पॉर्टेंट एंड आई डोंट आई डोंट थिंक दैट आई विल बी इन अ गुड पोजिशन टू एक्सप्लेन दैट टू यू पीपल सो दैट इज सुपर सेमी सुपरवाइज लर्निंग वी कैन जस्ट लीव दैट वी कैन जस्ट अंडरस्टैंड दैट इट इज काइंड ऑफ लर्निंग वेयर सम डेटा आर लेबल्ड एंड अदर डेटा इज नॉट लेबल्ड बट समथिंग वी कैन वी शुड लुक एट डेफिनेटली लुक एट द रीनफोर्समेंट लर्निंग सो हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू हैव recently seen the news that uh, or uh, apart from that how many of you have seen lot of robots that are walking uh, you have seen the companies that are making robots that can walk have any of you seen the videos of that in the internet toyota right yeah so emant has seen that toyota so they use reinforcement learning only so when uh i don't know what rpa is himat i only knew toyota <laughs> so yeah so they might be a new co- company also rp so yeah so uh, robotic process automation automation okay yeah okay so i also learned something new robotic process automation so yeah they they use reinforcement learning how they do let me just uh, give you an example so they will uh, their robot will will have like hundreds of sensors and each sensors each sensor will be considered a neuron and based on the input from each sensor and then they have uh, some kind of uh, hidden network also and it will be very complicated so it will be a lot of network will be there so based on this kind of the inputs from the sensor the limbs the limbs of the robot are going to react and let's say we just want the robot to stand and walk so we give some values to these uh, internal neural uh, in, internal neurons and then we get some output and with that output our robot was not able to stand so what we do we change and we say that this particular output was not good let's change it and we and with the with the new the new output the newly generated output uh, newly generated values for the correlation of these neurons the uh, robot was able to stand but then it fell so we we saw that based of, apart in the two uh, two simulations or the two scenarios that we have seen the second one was better so we give this particular scenario high value and we give this scenario low value so then this will be you know this will be kind of we are giving it reward so slowly slowly more and uh, no more and more values that are going towards uh, standing of this robot will be rewarded and finally we will have something which uh, some values of this correlation that will be that will enable the robot to walk so that's why you see when anywhere in the simulations also uh, when they are showing that the program is learning to play the game you will see that lot uh, they will start 50 cars let's say we are talking about uh, okay let's say we are talking about flappy bird so this is the these are the tubes that it has to go through so when they are starting they will start 50 of the birds and then each of them will be having some kind of neural network and different different values then they start uh, initially let's say only one of them pass through the first obstacle then they say okay the correlation value for this bird was good so next time when they are doing all the 50 will have somewhere similar correlation between them and let's say uh, now 20 pass the first obstacle but only 10 pass the second one then they will look at the these 10 and uh, they will say okay so these one uh, these values are very good so they take those values and then the next 50 are going to be somewhere around uh, somewhere around that so slowly slowly this is called like reinforcement learning you are reinforcing the good behavior and then you are learning and then you are uh, reinforcing again the better one then you are learning then the, you are reinforcing the till you get the best kind of correlation values for your neurons 
you keep on doing that. So this is kind of a reinforcement learning in practical. Now let's see how do we define it in theory. In theory, I bet it is going to be, you know, a little bit less understandable. So yeah. How intelligent agents, so it is defined as how intelligent agents can take action to an environment in order to maximize their notion of cumulative reward. So, yeah, so it's just see, it's like too wordy, it's too wordy and, uh, but let's, let's try to break this definition. So, how an intelligent agent can take action in an environment in order to maximize the cumulative so in the case of flappy bird the action would be go up and go down and also the we are saying the intelligent agent right so the intelligent agent are the 50 flappy birds that we created so each of those flappy birds are the agents and the action they take is going up or down in an environment so what is the environment composed composed of the environment is composed of let's say the distance from these pipes the distance between these pipes and the vertical position of the flappy bird. So this is the environment uh, stimuli that uh, are uh, no that the uh, bird is seeing. And then the bird is uh, the intelligent agent. This bird can take an action of going up or down in this environment to in order to maximize the cumulative reward. What is the cumulative reward? The longer it stays in air without hitting the pipe so this is the reinforcement learning i hope you are able to understand because uh, i don't see any way to make this uh, definition easier if it comes in some kind of exam that you might have to write this only luckily the assignments are uh, optional so you may be able to understand once you read the options okay so example for this how robots are walking And uh, then how the programmers, you know, how program plays the game, right? So this, uh, these are all a few examples of reinforcement learning. Now, uh, okay. <clears throat> so now let's see what is the difference. Is there an okay? Now let's see what is the difference between the you see here it's a, between reinforcement reinforcement learning and supervised learning so in supervised learning what we saw the input was given in the start itself and then we didn't change the input we just learned But very good, yeah. And the input was labeled. And in case of reinforcement learning, we don't have labeled input. We have some kind of input, so like uh, like in the Flappy Bird. If uh, if you look at some um, coders in the program, you will see that the bird will sense the distance from the pipe bird will sense the gap between the pipe and the vertical position of the bird so it has input but it doesn't have the output uh, so Hemant is typing decision by reward and no reward that's correct definitely so the output is not there so the output depends on state of current input Oh, so someone has left. Okay, so output depends on state of current input and next input 
depends on the output of previous input so it is like let's say the bird for this pipe the bird decided to jump and then it successfully crossed now the input of this bird whether it is up or down it was based on the output that was to jump or not jump of the previous decision you see it is kind of sequential the new input that is the information of the location of the bird will be decided <clears throat> based on the previous input that the bird whether it decided to jump or not so if the bird decided to jump there will be some new inputs if the bird decided not to jump it will be different input so it is a sequential input and output process so how in the bookish term it is written it is output depends on current input that is very true whether it will jump or not it depends on the input that is the distance and the position and next input depends on previous output so if previously it decided to go up or down the next input is going to be dependent on that because the bird, the positioning of the bird will change if it decided to jump or not right yes oh, so what is the next uh, so decision dependent so this is the basic definition uh, basic difference which, which we can club these two into one so input data is labeled and it is given at the start right and uh, oh sorry depend on previous output okay so these are the uh, this is the major difference and then the second one was uh, as heman told whether this is like uh, decision dependent and this one is labeled so we can remove it from here and keep it here only so the examples was again we know the examples for supervised and uh, reinforced learning so i'm not going to write them again okay so there are uh, how many types of reinforcement learning are there so there is positive reinforcement learning and there is negative reinforcement learning positive it's as the name suggests it is very uh, trivial kind of uh, definition the name suggests positive reinforcement learning it's like we reward the positive behavior or the positive the sequences if you want to go into the mathematical or the bookish definition it's like we reward the set of sequences that give the desired output and in this case it is we you know punish or we try to reduce this uh, set of sequences that don't give the desired output but there is a problem with reinforcement learning also as good as it is there is a problem with reinforcement learning that is different different advantages you can uh, see from the slides but let me talk about the disadvantage or the problem see when you are doing positive reinforced learning so what can happen is there can be n number of uh, possible parameters that will help you or that will uh, give you the correct solution the desired output let's see this this okay so i have erased that let's see the flappy bird so the flappy bird can cross this pipes either from here from here from here or either by jumping or by coming down from up so there are very there is a very vast majority of solution available so this this can cause a, a sort of overloading when you are training your uh, model whereas the negative one so how did we train the negative model we trained it such that the bad behavior or the bad set of sequence are punished and are not repeated so the bad when we are doing such things so what we are doing is we are 
only uh, prohibiting it to hit uh, not like to hit the pipe we are prohibiting it hitting the pipe so it is uh, maybe the answer that you are going to get is something like this so every time your bird is down and it only jumps when it has to cross the pipe it it doesn't look so interesting right it's like jumping and coming down then jumping and coming down so the the answer that you are going to get is the minimal acceptable answer you are not going to get a very good answer from this kind of approach you are going to get only a minimal acceptable answer whereas in this uh, this kind of uh, positive reinforcement learning there can be an overload of you know the possible sort of answers just uh, not very important but just i wanted to tell that every you know machine learning has its own uh, disadvantages reinforced learning apart being used everywhere in, in today's world it also has its disadvantages let's move on to something more important so in every machine learning system uh, there was a nice figure that sir showed so after let's say you have uh, done so for uh, let's say for training you have training data today i am not able to write nicely i don't know why you have training data then you have to do some pre processing of data so these are the components of machine learning system pre processing and then feature extraction and then you train and then after that there is validation and all those things are there so let's see what are what is this pre processing feature extraction so let's say uh, i have bunch of sensors in field in my crop field in my agricultural field i have bunch of sensors and now i am doing some kind of machine learning operation with them so you should know that sensors don't always give correct value let's say i had one sensor so sensors uh, the sensor is designed in some way or it is giving a faulty value right so <clears throat> uh, how many of you know what is nan what is the meaning of nan in programming lot of times some variables will come nan is even though it should have been a number 1 2 3 4 5 the you know the value that you see is uh, not a number it's like nan oh so i i said an answer itself so nan in programming means it is an abbreviation for not a not a number so sometimes the sensors when you see in the excel sheet or whatever format you are saving your data you will see that some places it is giving nan now you cannot use these kind of readings in your machine learning application right so we need to filter these out so th that is all done in pre oh, pre processing pre processing so what does pre processing have it has data cleaning that is like uh, removing the uh, readings that are not in your desired format let me just write it as simplistically uh, simplistically i am writing removing none removing not a number values then there is data integration since i have bunch of sensors i will need to collate those sensors data and then only i can use them so this is also uh, this also comes under uh, data integration and then we have data transformation so as you have seen so i will write it here combining different sensor data right they, then there is data transformation what is data transformation so if you remember 
I talked about classification problem in supervised learning. So there I gave a photo, but you, we know that we cannot use the photo on its own for our machine learning. We need to convert those pixel data into matrices. So we have image to pixel matrix. So these kind of this is these are called some of the examples for these processes which are involved in the data processing oh sorry pre-processing pre-processing involves data cleaning data integration and data transformation so now when we have done the pre-processing let's look at the feature extraction after doing the pre-processing and removing all the garbage data let's look at the feature extraction okay so let me let me ask you this let's say so you have to give an answer in the chat by yes or no okay so let me ask you this i have n features no um, i have n column of data from my sensor i got some value x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 x6 so these are all bunch of data some numbers only and then I have uh, Y data, which I, so I want my model to uh, give me the value of uh, Y when I give it some value of X1, X2, X3, X4, X5 and X6. So, uh, so for that, I have a lot of training data. Okay. So is it always necessary to use all the six features? So these are all called features. Is it always necessary to all the use six features? Turns out most of the time when we are dealing with some simple uh, machine learning problems it is not required to use all the features so uh, so that's why we do some uh, some sort of not necessary gulshan has rightly said not necessary so that's why we use some sort of correlation test or statistical test between the features its features themselves why do we do that see let's say your I am uh, talking very hypothetically, but let's say your x3 was equal to 2x1. There was some sensor reading, which was x, uh, which was x3, and some some uh, other reading was x1, and we, it turned out to be x3 is equal to 2x1. Now, whatever information your x1 feature, the feature x1, is giving to your model, the same information is going to be given by x3 also. It is just twice. So it is not necessary to include X3 and X1 both in your model. You can make do with either X3 or X1. So you can remove this feature. And let's say you have, uh, you know, you are predicting something. You want to predict something. And then you see that X6, the feature X6 or some reading that you are getting from the sensor, one of the reading is not even changing but your output is changing and other values are changing. So if this value of X6 is not changing, that means it has zero influence on your output. So when it has zero influence on your output, it doesn't, you don't need to train your model with this data because it is just a wastage of uh, resources and uh, higher computational time without giving us any new output. So we do some kind of feature extraction and identify what are the most important features to be used for our model so that we can get a efficient and optimal model so that is feature extraction okay now okay after feature extraction we have a feedback loop so that i conveniently forgot to draw in this small figure that i have drawn so we had training data and we had we did the pre-processing then we did feature extraction and then we did training and in training we go back so when we did the training we found out the current model is not that good while training in the process of training itself so we uh, sent a feedback to our uh, uh, training process the pre-processing and the feature extraction we send a feedback that please uh, make some changes in the parameter and then we will train again so the kind of feedback so that is the feedback loop you tell your uh, model you tell the 
feature extraction and the uh, pre processing pro uh, pre processing method that uh, we need to change some parameters here for a better result so that is feedback loop it is very important to go back and forth and check and then only we will get a nice valid model and after all that there is testing and validation which by by now you should be knowing i have also told many of the times and sir has also told that it is very important to validate your data or test your data based on some unseen readings unseen stimuli reading external values or something so this this uh, consists so this constitutes your machine learning system okay so and in the ppt it on uh, the ppt sir also discussed it is also important i will make a note of it we will not go into the detail of that the deep learning does not have the feature extraction and selection and it uh, takes the whole data so deep learning doesn't have feature extraction so they, it may come as a mcq or some sort of questions so you yeah, know you can see that <clears throat> okay now let's come to agriculture so by uh, as of now we have seen only the components of machine learning and we have not yet seen how it is going to be uh, useful in agriculture uh, like in soil and crop management so there are uh, why do we even use this why do we even use machine learning in agriculture so there are some challenges now agriculture field because of the increasing population the agriculture field is facing lot of challenges right that food demand is increasing right then uh, the climate uh, climate change climate change is there now the natural resources are depleting soils are becoming less and less fertile right and then uh, people are changing their dietary habits so based on that agriculture has agriculture field and the farmers have to modify uh, their practices so that they can get most benefit and uh, op at an optimum procedure while not actually harming the nature so if you have to do that if there are so many uh, factors that are affecting so it's only natural you think that if we can actually train our machines or use uh, can take the help of our machines to identify an optimum path or set of optimum uh, you know st steps so that uh, we can have a, a improvement in agricultural field so to overcome these challenges that i have mentioned and that are listed in the slides that is why uh, machine learning came into agriculture and that was after uh, that practice of using machine learning in agriculture was called precision agriculture so there also uh, there was a definition a very a very big definition if i recall that was given by uh, that sir uh, represented it was from international society of precision agriculture yes so what how how do they define mach precision agriculture so it is a management strategy first of all let's get this clear that it is a management strategy it will tell you how to manage your resources okay so it is a management strategy that gathers data that gathers processes you know and analyzes the data analyzes what the data that you uh, get at a temporal scale means uh, you every second or every 5 uh, minutes you get this data and you get it in a spatial scale for throughout your farm you get this data or at at every 10 meter interval or every 1 meter interval or an individual scale it's like uh, you get the data for each plant so precision agriculture 
is just a management strategy that gathers, processes, analyzes the data on a temporal scale, spatial scale, or individual scale, and then <clears throat> uses some other informations also. In uh, apart from this, it uses other information. Let's say, so these were the field information. Let's say it uses the information from uh, satellite or the precipitation information it is taking. It is using all this information to make management decisions. So it is a management strategy which uses a bunch of data. It gathers the data, processes the data, analyzes this data, and gives us, and it helps us to make management decisions. And what are we managing actually? We are managing our resources. for efficient productivity, quality, profitability, and sustainability. So what we are managing? We are managing resources for uh, good uh, productivity, then uh, good quality, and then profitability. And sustainability, of course, if uh, things are not sustainable, then, you know, there's no point for uh, innovation is nothing if it is not sustainable. I like to say this. Yeah, so sustainability will always come. So let's just say precision, precision agriculture is a management strategy that gathers processes, uh, gathers processes and analyzes the data on a temporal scale, spatial scale, individual data set, and combines that data with other information coming from external sources to make management decisions, to uh, manage what? Manage resources for a good productivity, quality, and profitability, and while being sustainable. So this is how we understand that uh, very big definition. If you just go on trying to memorize that, then it will be very difficult. Now, what are the components of precision agriculture? You can, uh, I will just list, list out. It was nice, uh, a nice figure was, uh, sir showed a nice uh, figure. So it was uh, GIS crop. Uh, so the satellite map for the crop field, that can be one. Then recommendations that this recommendations made by the model right then uh, there's stress detection uh, stress detecting uh, ai or the algorithms or sensors then uh, variable rate technology okay so let me explain what was that for that maybe we will write this algorithm for stress detection then four vegetation is definitely a part without vegetation there is no agriculture then there was variable rate technology so this gis is like drone satellite imagery uh, recommendation is the model that is making the recommendation the ai model and algorithm for stress stress detection is like processing the data from the model Vegetation is the, the crop that we have. Now, what is this variable rate technology? So I was wondering, and I searched in the internet, and so uh, it is the different, it is the technology that will govern the different, different rate for uh, different scenarios. For fertilizer, let's say we have different rate. For water, we have different rate. So it's just some kind of uh, technology which is going to give different rates to different components in different scenarios. So these are not, this is, I don't think it is very important, but it is just, uh, since it was there, I just showed it. These are the components of precision in agriculture. Okay, uh, so before going this, if is there anything else I want to say? Mm, okay, so let's, let's go with this. So there, uh, there have been studies 
you know the people have used machine learning in uh, agriculture and they have started to uh, improve their crop productivity and this uh, this uh, map it is just showing number of papers that have been published using machine learning in agriculture and you can see that uh, china is the highest one chinese people they don't leave anything so uh, my professor also says that uh, the research teams uh, in china are very strong in one lab they will have bunch of people working in same topic so china is the country which most contribution in the development of uh, ml in agri okay so they are contributing the most now which machine learning process actually is contributing the most so there might be a question also artificial neural network as i also told you guys artificial neural network is the uh, deep learning uh, technique or the machine learning technique that is being used most widely in the uh, precision agriculture or uh, agriculture to improve agriculture okay now which crop is uh, mo- studied the most it is maize maize is the crop most studied crop when it comes to ml in agri so these are like just some stats i wanted to show because some questions can be framed from these kind of statistics now let's look at this uh, crop management so basically precision agriculture we use uh, we use for crop management uh, in agriculture what is that crops water soil and livestock so we use precision agriculture for cro- uh, we can use for crop uh, crop management water management soil management and livestock so in this course as as sir said that we are going to discuss crop management and soil management so let's look at crop management so there also uh, the definition was uh, very uh, hard to grasp this definition that was shown in the class so let's uh, let's look at the definition and uh, let's try to break if we can you uh, know understand that definition in a different way so uh, crop management involves versatile aspects that originate from farming techniques and are used to manage biological chemical and physical crop in uh, crop environment with the aim to reach uh, qualitative and quantitative goals Now it it looks very uh, weird and very not relatable to understand right so just let's just uh, look at the phrase by phrase now it involves versatile aspects means bunch of scenarios bunch of aspects are being considered here aspects is nothing but uh, scenarios let's uh, yeah let's consider aspects nothing but scenarios like uh, this is happening or that is happening bunch of conditions that originate from farming techniques so if you are doing uh, if you are in agriculture and you are farming so there will be a bunch of uh, conditions that will, you will face you know and these these are used to manage biological chemical uh, and physical crop man, uh, crop environment so uh, let's say weed you want to uh, remove the weed so that is one aspect so that can that is a part of crop management let's say you want to put fertilizer so it is also a one one of the aspect that you uh, that will be coming in the crop management so these are the involves versatile aspect that part is going to denote this so what is uh, crop management <coughs> it is yeah let me write it here itself i want to discuss something else there so it involves versatile aspects that are different different practices different different things you do in the field and they are originated from farming techniques only so before uh, before machine learning we used to do these things so these versatile aspects like uh, yield prediction or uh, you know the 
वीड रिमूवल और फर्टिलाइजेशन एप्लीकेशन और बंच ऑफ डिफरेंट थिंग्स दे हैव ओरिजिनेटेड फ्रॉम आवर कन्वेंशनल फार्मिंग प्रैक्टिस ओनली सो द वर्सटाइल एक्सपेक्ट दैट ओरिजिनेटेड फ्रॉम फार्मिंग प्रैक्टिस टू मैनेज सो वाई वी वर डूइंग वीडिंग वी वर ट्राइंग टू रिमूव सम अनडिजायरेबल प्लांट सो वी आर हियर वी आर टू मैनेज बायोलॉजिकल सो वी आर रिमूविंग समथिंग विथ ऑर्गेनिक कंटेंट सो वी आर यूजिंग लाइक द बायोलॉजिकल मैनेजिंग द बायोलॉजिकल इन्वायरमेंट एंड द केमिकल इन्वायरमेंट वी आर मैनेजिंग द बाई गिविंग फर्टिलाइजर एंड फिजिकल इन्वायरमेंट इज समथिंग Uh, we can say the spacing of the crop and all those things so the it involves the uh, various aspects you know that originated from farming practices to manage biological chemical and physical crop environment and why do we do that we do uh, we do all these things for a qualitative and quantitative targets so to meet some certain yield demand we are doing all these things so this is just the definition of the breakdown of the definition of crop management now here are the fields that were there in the crop management that is yield prediction disease detection weed detection crop recognition crop quality soil management water management livestock management so uh, they have a uh, Uh, research this uh, paper uh, sir referred to this paper beno settle 2021 i also looked at the paper and they have done a very nice uh, thing that is feature extraction so they have done the feature extraction and they have told that these are the <coughs> uh, uh, feature extraction on a bigger scale actually they have done that and then they have told these are going to be the factors that are going to be responsible and you, you should use for your yield prediction these are going to be for disease detection and uh, sim similarly for different different crop management practices we are going to discuss crop management and uh, soil soil management yeah so in the crop management let's see the yield prediction it is very uh, sir has made it very clear that uh, yield prediction is one of the toughest when we are looking for uh, when we are going for the crop management practices because it depends on environment right it depends on your management practices even if the environment is very good if you are not watering the plants then your yield will be affected management practice then it uh, depends on if your crop is very sensitive what is the genotype and phenotype so if you don't understand what genotype and phenotype means so let me tell you so see every every living organism has a certain set of genetic sequence when the genetic sequence is best for certain scenario we say that uh, the, that is the genotype for that scenario right the best genetic sequence or the desirable genetic sequence for a particular scenario will be called the genotype of that scenario similarly phenotype is physical characteristics so the best physical features the physical attributes of any uh, plant for a certain scenario will be called the phenotype for that scenario so it will depend on the crop genotype and phenotype so uh, like uh, we recently it came into news that uh, so basically all these uh, genotypes and phenotypes they are called uh, hybrid crops and uh, you may recall that it came into news that uh, india exported uh, genetically modified rice to the europe the europe uh, european nation they are very uh, against uh, you know these uh, genetically modified crops but i just uh, uh, genotypes are obtained and genotypes and phenotypes are obtained from genetic modification so yield prediction will depend on environment 
it will depend on management practices it will depend on what type of crop you have and the crop interaction how the crop is uh, interacting with the surrounding environment and uh, uh, this uh, deep learning deep learning technique of machine learning that uses artificial neural network and convolution neural network is proposed is uh, so sir discussed a paper where they used this uh, machine learning method for uh, yield prediction we are not going into the details of that because we look at all those aspects more in detail in the coming weeks okay so after this uh, uh, yield prediction there, there is another aspect uh, that is disease detection so traditional practices uh, when we uh, so you all i don't know if you have uh, helped your mom in home or not but when we are uh, you know peeling some tomatoes or uh, uh, getting some mutters you know in home then my uh, our mom will say show me whether it is we'll see some weird color on the potato and we'll say it is not good we'll show our mom she will say no 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 this is good it is not the disease you know right so these are the conventional conventionally people visually used to see uh, the uh, agricultural produce and then uh, they used to decide whether it is uh, disease affected or not that is very cumbersome and time taking so machine vision has been used has been proposed to use for uh, you know uh, uh, disease detection in plants using machine learning machine vision like you take the photo and then you see you analyze the different uh, pixels and you see this pixel uh, that the photo is showing that this is uh, this potato as sir showed in slide that is uh, which with certain disease or not so that is machine vision so what was discussed was that uh, <coughs> put uh, machine vision to check the disease uh, detection in potatoes and then they used also image recognition not image recognition image processing similar to machine vision for uh, detecting plant disease in plants that through the leaves uh, of the plants so through the discoloration or the texture of the leaf they were able to uh, identify whether the plant was diseased or not and then the potato some kind of pattern so some gangrene and all those things so were discussed in the slide so those are some kind of diseases not that important but yes we should know that now one more thing that i feel that uh, we should know see when we are doing uh, these kind of uh, disease detection through imagery through machine vision so what we are doing exactly is we are looking for certain features on the potato let's say uh, we we were looking for uh, some black patches so to do this kind of processes of uh, disease detection the best technique is convolution neural network because what if you if you at all want to learn machine learning in future you will realize that convolution neural network is much better than artificial neural network when it comes to image processing why machine vision why is that because it will take the features of this process when you train the convolution neural network it will identify that okay this white patch this white patch with this black patch this if it is occurring more on the potato it means that the potato is uh, having disease it will actually identify the features whereas artificial neural network it will just give you some random values which when you multiply it will give either correct or not but the accuracy rate of convolution neural network is so high because it is actually going to identify okay that this white patch i in the photo of this potato i have to search whether this white patch is there on the potato or not if it is there then i will give that this uh, potato is having disease so this convolution neural network is very important when we are going for the de disease de detection okay then we have uh, weed detection so very nicely uh, there was an uh, uav 
then uh, drones and uh, on land since on land robots are showed that that can be used for the this is the weed detection and uh, also one thing to uh, remember is that weeds have impacted highest on the agricultural produce so highest impact is caused by weed uh, uh, highest impact on crop production if any crop anything is caused that is weed detection why because uh, see uh, we grow in it madras uh, i also do research on uh, plants not uh, i have not yet used machine learning we do analytical modeling but we when we grow crops see we have to give fertilizer water regularly to the uh, to the crops that we want to grow but when it comes to weed we don't have to give them anything they will grow on their own on moreover we have to go and pluck them out see we when we uh, leave the place where we are going the crop we leave the greenhouse as it is our crops will die but the weeds will thrive because they are so resilient they need very less resource and they can survive in different uh, drastic conditions so that's why uh, there is a need to remove this weed from our crop field there is mechanical control that is you go and uh, remove it with hand that is very inefficient uh, right inefficient method then there is chemical and then uh, again chemical can be uh, although we will design the chemical so that it doesn't harm our crop but it can be still uh, it can still harm the crop and uh, the weeds after some time they can uh, grow resistant to this uh, to the chemicals and then on the on the other hand it is costly also so uh, using machine learning to develop you know to do this uh, weed detection is also very helpful so what what do what is used so machine learning with the drone footage and then spectros uh, spectroscopy is used for weed detection so that at least you can narrow down the area of your uh, uh, you know uh, this chemical application so it will just uh, identify the crops we still have to do either mechanical or chemical process of weed removal after that so it can uh, in the big plot let's say one acre of your field it identifies that in this corner there are more more weeds so you can go and uh, do mechanical or chemical whichever process of weed removal you want to do okay <clears throat> okay so then uh, then there is crop recognition and uh, for crop recognition also uh, leaves are basically used the most for identifying crops of different sort that is something uh, that's not in, that important then there is soil testing so uh, soil testing why soil testing is important so i will tell you a story uh, based on my personal experience see uh, when you grow crops it is natural that we are applying fertilizer because nowadays uh, if you don't apply fertilizer to the you know field uh, the, the growth of crops it's it will not be very good so they so we have to apply fertilizer nowadays the soil productivity have, in most of the areas have depleted a lot okay so why do we need to do soil testing so what happened with our uh, in our case was in our greenhouse we made artificial soil so we made soil using some different different inorganic components and one organic component now that soil has different uh, requirement of fertilizer and if you don't test that the components of that soil and you modify your fertilizer input accordingly then it can have detrimental impact on your crop productivity and the same thing happened with us also what happened was that we uh, our all the crops they grew to some extent when uh, like, let's say they grew till uh, they have to grow 2 meter high they uh, grew till 1 meter so we we are growing basically sorghum in our greenhouse 
and uh, till five six leaves it was fine and then suddenly all the leaves it was still growing but the leaves started to you know uh, turn yellowish they started dying so we were not realizing that the this this soil this particular soil that we have artificially made it is having a different uh, nitrogen requirement different nitrogen phosphorus potassium requirement that generally is constituent constituent of the fertilizer so as the plant grew it demanded more and more uh, fertilizer but we were fixed to the fertilizer uh, input of the normal natural soil so that is why uh, it is very important that uh, we do soil testing before the fertilizer application otherwise it can kill our uh, crops and uh, mo uh, more thing that uh, so that is that is one and mostly how machine learning is being used in soil testing is to uh, check for soil organic matter and sir has shared papers for that and soil moisture content and the <clears throat> the instrument or the reading that is being used for this is actually uh, the dual reflectance spectroscopy so what happens is the radiation coming from sun it is going to be reflected in different so when the uh, radiation comes from sun it is going to be uh, the radiation will be uh, x ray uh, then uh, uv ray and then uh, visible radiation so different different soil based on different moisture content or the so it is surface moisture content only we can only identify surface moisture content and uh, or not to not very deep so let's say shallow yeah and then soil organic content based on different soil organic content the wave band of the reflected rays is going to be different so if we input that and we train our model if we know how the soil organic matter is reflecting the solar radiation and if we know how the uh, wet soil or the dry soil is reflecting solar radiation then we can train our model to identify based on the uh, mobile photo or based on the image of from the satellite how much portion of the land is well irrigated having most soil moisture how much portion of the land is having more organic content so that we need to go and uh, mix some sand or silt in that so th that is one of the applications of machine learning so i think we have covered the so i i think we already crossed crossed the time for questions but these are the questions that are not in your assignment they were actually there in the previous year's assignment so we we will discuss these questions on the the next week i will share the ppt you can try to answer these questions on your own but i think we'll end the session for today two hour i didn't want to go for that long but since you guys were here uh no one left not or or not many people left so i just continued with the flow so we'll end the session for today uh, next i will share this uh, this ppt and both my notes so you can go through them and try to answer the questions these are questions are from previous year assignments so it can be helpful for you for your future exam uh, ankush uh, uh, one uh, i'll just take half a uh, half a minute yeah uh, yeah actually one i see uh, uh, i i could not join actually last two classes actually week one and week two i think this is like actually this is the first class actually which you have started this is actually looking like it is seeming like a week one is yes, uh, yes, week yes. One. so we were advised to start only after week two has been shared then only you should uh, conduct your first session of week one so we will be one session uh, delayed every time okay. okay so now we are actually in week one right yes so uh, in in this session this is week one in actual nptel course they have uh, sh uh, shared the week 2 content also correct correct i saw that yeah yeah okay okay thank you yeah thank you okay guys then uh, we'll end the meeting for today and and angrish one more one yes. question and have, uh, when we have any questions or something during during the course of the week and like how can we uh, how can we uh, approach yeah. you so yes you uh, you can ask me uh, directly in the session or you can put in the discussion prompt will be there in nptl okay so you can uh, ask in either of the two portals so we we'll 
uh, we'll answer that. We'll try to answer that. Sure, sure. sure. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So anyone and anyone else has any question? Okay, guys. Thank you for so patiently listening to the session. I'll end the session now.